Good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today, isn't it? So I woke up irritable this morning. I walked in here and felt that energy, and I was like, man, God is good. And then y'all, y'all, this beautiful greeter back there, so I went to go shake her hand, and she said, we do hugs around here. And I was like, man, that's amazing. But I, but I tell you what really touched my heart, that young lady that got that little Jesus, all of our gods were at healing Appalachia these past few days, and there's a very likely chance she got that from one of our guys. And them guys are running around there sharing the love of Christ and sharing the gospel, and that touches my heart. Because there was a lot of lost souls in that place. I, I was there these past three days, and it's just a blessing to see those men over there serving and, uh, and, and handing out those little Jesuses. So, God, God is good. So, my name's Richard Green. I'm the outreach coordinator and marketing of God's Way Home, uh, sober living over in Raynell, West Virginia, a little bitty old town about 20 minutes south from here. Uh, only one red light in town, and we're right at the corner of that one. So that's about the easiest directions I can give you. So um, just a little backstory about God's Way Home. If you know Andrew Bales, he's the pastor of Orient Hill Tabernacle over up on Orient Hill, up on the hill. And uh, he was called to step out of engineering and become a pastor. Um, he started traveling around southern West Virginia and sharing the gospel and preaching and he was preaching out of Acts 12.5 where they were talking about prayer where he had a burden on his heart for those that were struggling and broken and lost and addicted and homeless and in jails and, and stuff like that. And uh, he kept asking the churches to pray for these folks. Well, eventually over time, people were coming to him and saying, there's a need in this community. You know, a lot of people are hurt. A lot of people are homeless. A lot of people are getting locked up. A lot of people are addicted to different substances, but there's no resources. There was no where for them to go other than going to jail and well, going to jail doesn't work and it doesn't help um so god put on his heart to start a sober living ministry and if you know andrew he's never drank he's never done any of that he knows that nothing about recovery and addiction um and he ended up looking into that building right there at the corner of the stoplight it used to be the old dentist office but back in 2016 the flood basically destroyed the whole inside of it and they were selling it for five grand and he didn't know where he was gonna get the money from. And he kept praying on it, praying on it. Well, he ended up inheriting some money and he took five grand of that, ended up buying the building and most of the material and labor was donated to help renovate that whole place from the inside out. And that was back in 2020. Well, he didn't know where the money was gonna come from to open the doors. Well, in 2021, he started filing for grants and he got blessed with a grant, was able to open the doors in June of 2021. So this year we celebrated three years of that door being open and leading, thank you. And, and, and helping men and leading them to Christ. Our foundation and our center is Jesus Christ. That's what we share and preach and teach. That's what we do. And those doors opened back in 2021. That was, uh, they had about probably six, seven beds back then. And now we have 24 beds. It has grown over the last three years. God has blessed it. Those other beds, those other seven beds, we just opened those up a week ago. We own the Valley Works building across the street from it, right next to the church right there on the corner. There's a building behind it. That used to be storage, but we ended up turning that into sober living because we knew we needed more beds. I mean, we have a waiting list a mile long, stacks of applications, and we can't, we can't take them in. We don't have enough beds. Um, so the HVAC system got installed about a week ago and we finally opened it up and we're moving men into those, into those beds. Um, we've had about 58 men come through the program in the last three years. We've had eight that have actually graduated the program. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization. It's a one year program, 365 days. Um, well, we, we all were all certified. So most of our men do come out of the court system, out of the prison system. We're not a detox treatment facility, so we don't allow the men to detox all substances at our program, but we do send them to Crosswinds or Harmony Ridge or somewhere else to detox, get off the substances, and then they come into our program. And once they come into our program, they're on a 30-day restriction period, case by case base, but they're on a buddy system, no phone, can't work. Just in that, those 30 days, just take that time to focus on you, your recovery, um, a lot of the guys either turned away from God or don't know who God is, and, and they don't sure he had a gospel on a daily basis. Within a matter of weeks, I mean, these men are going to the altar and repented of their sins, 
and turning the life over to Christ and went baptizing him in the creek down the road down there in Crawley. Um, it's an absolute blessing to see. It's a blessing to see God work and he's working miracles and he's a miracle worker still and he ain't done. We see it every single day here in Greenbrier County. Every single day at God's Way Home, God working miracles in these men's lives because they come in there broken, hopeless, lost, no sense of direction and nothing and get a relationship with God, which is most important and then start getting their life back together. So after the 30 day restriction period, they can go back to work, go back to school and they start getting their life back together. Uh, we set recovery goals for them, you know, get the license, get a car, you know, so forth and so on. And then also if they have kids and family, you get to see that relationship rebuild. We got one guy back there now, uh, Jason, he's rebuilding his relationship with his kids and, and, uh, and his family. Uh, Remy up here up front, you know, building a relationship with his son and getting to have weekends with him, just seeing stuff like that. It's the little things that are just amazing that we get to see. Um, and they start getting the light back together. We do multiple Bible, Bible studies with them each week. They go to church three times a week. Uh, we have some recovery meetings. Um, one of my groups that I was doing was Bible study on Tuesday mornings, but I turned it into basic life skills because a lot of these men come in here don't know basic life skills, you know, finances, how to deal with emotions, so forth and so on. I didn't, I didn't say this in the beginning, but I'm in recovery myself. I got saved back in 2015 by the grace of God, and I was atheist, broken, lost, and in the madness for 15 years. Um, and it's all, it's all glory to God. Um, I give him all the credit. I couldn't do it without him. Um, I was in South Florida and I rehab my fourth rehab back in 2015. And I was in an AA meeting about three weeks in and the guy in there was sharing the gospel and it just touched my heart. Um, and I wanted it because I got tired of carrying those chains and all that baggage and being so broken and hopeless and nothing was fulfilling me. And he told me that night, he, he was sharing that night when he was sharing his story, he said, no matter where you're at, no matter what you did, God can meet you exactly where you are in your mess. You don't have to be in a church. You don't need a pastor to lay hands on you. You don't need to be at all. And I'm not minimizing that at all. But God can meet you exactly where you're at. And that van, that's 18, pa or 10 pastors of van on the way back, I couldn't stop thinking about what he was talking about. And I wanted it so bad. He was talking about repentance and confessing with your lips that Jesus is Lord and he can be saved in Romans 10. And I wanted it. And that night I laid my, my head down in that van and I prayed and I opened my heart to Christ. And I repented and my life changed since then. And, it, and it's a blessing to be able to give that back to these men and watch God work in their life. Um, I kind of got off track, but um, so far we've had eight graduates that have completed the program. Uh, God willing, we have two more coming up in October that are going to graduate the program uh, and a couple more coming up in December. Um, we have three buildings. We, like I said, we have the dentist office that holds, I think about what, nine. And then the back building holds six, that one that we just opened up. And then we have another house on 11th street. Um, it's a blue house with a cross on it. And that one holds, I think about eight or nine men. And our goal is to continue to expand and grow, um, so that we can continue to reach people that are struggling, suffering and hurting that are in need. Um, and our long-term goal, um, we don't house women currently, we're not co-ed. There is CISO is in Dawson, so there is a nonprofit women's program in Greenbrier County, but our long-term goal is to eventually be able to open up a women's program also so we can house both of them so that we can continue to expand because we're the only men's sober living program in Greenbrier County in the five surrounding counties until you get to Raleigh County and Kanawha County, that's it. We're the only ones. And, it, and there's a huge need in this community and in Southern, and, and just West Virginia in general, but really just the whole country in general. Um, overdose rate is through the roof. It's nationwide, it's over 100,000 people dying from overdose every single year from the age of about 18 to 40. Um, and just in this state, you know, overdose rate is, is really high. I've just seen recently it is lowering a little bit, but that's, you know, probably gonna end up increasing at some point. Um, but I have some guys here with us today. I like for one of them to come up here and, and share their testimony and just share about what God is doing in their, his, their life and how God's way home has helped them. So um, I'm gonna have one of our graduates, uh, Russell, 
you'd like to come on up and, and share your testimony with us. And he's doing really well. He's got his own place, started up his own little side business. Um, I've been doing really good in recovery, and he loves to go around and share his testimony, not just in churches, but he also goes around the different schools to the students and gets to share his testimony, too. But with that, I'll give you Russell. Praise God. Well, the hardest part's over. I made it up the steps without falling, you know. <laughs> um, my name is Russell. Um, I spent my entire life lost in addiction. When I was uh, 12 years old, I ended up having major surgeries, put me in the hospital, they sent me home with pain pills. Whenever they was gone, my want for them wasn't. So I struggled for a long time doing whatever I had to do for my fix. You know, I, I robbed from people that was good to me. I stole from everybody in the neighborhood. I become a nuisance, you know. The person that I was then, me now, would not want anything to do with him. I've done some things that are foul. I've wronged my family. My hero was my mother. My dad left when we was eight years old. And the things that I've done to my mom, I would not do to anyone in this world. And it breaks my heart today because I ended up going to prison back in 2019 and she died eight months after I got locked up. I had not spoken to her in over a year and I could not apologize. You know, your family is pretty much all you got other than God. And like, I turned away. I run as far as I could get from it. For the longest time, there was, to me, there was no God. I did not believe in none of it. And then I get out of prison in 21, and I live in a, a little town in Pocahontas County called Slady Fork. I was working at a sawmill over there. I was living on the property. I had nobody to talk to. And I stayed sober for eight months like this. And it, it tore at me because, you know, a person in recovery, you need friends. You need family. You need a lot of people's family when they're in a position like I'm in, because most of my family's gone, is the brothers and sisters that you get in recovery. And I had nothing. I had my job and had a trailer. And that was all I had. And then another guy moved into the property with me, and he brought drugs with him. And I was right back at it. You know, I, I just, I didn't have the will to say no. I didn't want to say no. I wanted to get out of the mindset that I was in. And from being an addict my entire life, the only way I knew to escape the things that I had been through was to use. So for the next probably six to eight months, I was back at it. I went from... 230 pounds down to 165 pounds. Uh, I'd lost all my weight, all my pride in myself, everything that I had, uh, it was gone. And I didn't care, you know. When you're in that state of mind, there's nothing that matters. No family, no kids, no job, no house, nothing that matters more than the drugs does. And I lost my job lost my place to live again. I went back to jail. When I got back out of jail again, I moved into an apartment and I was right back at it again. Just using, using, using. Whatever I had to do, I was robbing from the guy I was renting from to get my fix. It didn't matter. And then one morning, something, something hit me. I don't know what it was. I didn't know what it was at the time. I know now it was God. He told me, come into my head, and he said, it's time for you to change your ways. I cannot live like this no more. I was skin and bones, being wanted, chased by people, and I, I quit. I just, I was, and it's the first time in my life that I'd ever been able to put anything down and not be sick, not be hurting 
and just not want to use any more. And a month had gone by, and I'd gotten my, in touch with my parole officer, and I said, I can't do this no more. I cannot stay here. It's right up the road. It's right beside my apartment. You know, there's no escaping the madness when I'm living where I'm at. And she said, well, come in to me Wednesday, and we'll put you somewhere else, somewhere where you can prosper. I got a lot of respect for that woman because instead of putting me back into the system where a lot of parole officers will put you, she gave me a chance. She took me to uh, St. Joseph's. And because I had previously quit using it, I didn't have any substance in my system, they said that they could not help me. And they said that the only way that they could help me is if I had substance in my system. And my first thought was, what do you want me to do, God? And get high to get help? I mean, is that how you're supposed to do it? And he's like, no, let's make one phone call. They called God's Way Home. And like, there's an application process and everything like that. And usually in, in a waiting list a mile long. And I don't know why God chose me to help change my life and make me into a better person. Within two hours of making that phone call, they was there to pick me up. They took me to God's way. And still at this time, you know, I, I, I did not believe in God. And I get to this little place. Like, and the crazy thing is, is I grew up in Greenbrier County, like in Rupert. And that's like six miles from Raynell. I had moved away. I went to North Carolina, then to Beckley, and stayed in Beckley and Beaver and all that for years. And like they told me where this place was at. I was like, I'm, you know, I'm going where I was raised as a child, a little child. And I get there, and it's, it's like, it's warm. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's not like, it's welcoming. And the, guy, the crazy thing is, like, I'm a convicted felon. And the guy that come and picked me up, I figured it was going to be some dressed-up preacher in a, in a, in a two-piece suit that's going to take me over to his place because, you know, the name of it is God's Way Home, and that's what I thought. Some roughneck country boy comes up in a Toyota Tundra. I get in there, and the only thing I see is guns. I'm like, yeah, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> So I get to God's way home, and Andrew Bales, God has chose that man, and he put him where he needs to be. I have never in my life seen anyone that, is not addic that has not been addicted to drugs or alcohol be so understanding and have so much knowledge of an addict's behaviors and what an addict needs. Like he is, like Richard said, he has never drank, never used drugs, anything like that. And his understanding, it, just, it, it baffles me. And that's like what started the tug at my heart because like he didn't judge me. He didn't look down on me, you know. He see, like he didn't see the tattoos on my face. He seen me. And he watched as... The weeks went by, you know, the change in me, the, the lightness that come to me, the happiness. When I was lost in addiction, I was quiet. I would not talk to no one. The only person I spoke to was the person I got my drugs from. I went and got my drugs, and I went and hid, and I stayed high. That's how I lived. I'm not quiet no more. You cannot recover quietly. If you try to recover quietly, you're going to relapse. You have to have family ship, friendship. You have to have people around that love you, and you have to do it out loud because there are people that are dying in the silence. And three weeks after I get there, I'm sitting in church, and it's a Wednesday. And I, I felt that real warm feeling again. And something come over me and said, it's time for you to change you need to get saved. 
So I went up and I talked to Andrew. And I asked him, you know, can you help me get saved? And we went up to the altar and I confessed my sins and I asked for repentance. And from then, you know, like it was just happy. I've been a long time not being happy. And I've spent my, my life in the dredges just getting by, just maintaining. And that's all I was doing. And, like, I mean, I struggled. You know, my mom died due to drug, drug use. My dad died due to alcoholism. My cousins, my aunts, my uncles, all of them's gone. I have one aunt and a sister. That's all I have left. I have no children. I cannot have children. But I've come to copes with that over the years. You know, I love kids. Like, they're great, you know what I mean? Because, like, you can talk to an adult, and an adult will lie to you. you know, does my hair look nice today? Sure, it does. Sure, it does. You got a big old spot missing right here. You look at a kid and say, does this shirt make me look fat? <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> Stupid. But, you know, so, like, I, I, I steal kids, not in the, you know, like, yeah, kidnapping kind of way, but, like, kids love me, and I don't understand why, because, you know, I figured with the tattoos on my face and on, cover, on my arms and stuff like that, that, like, it would scare them, and it doesn't. They're concerned about whether it washes off, but it don't, but it's all right, you know. Part of the reasons for the tattoo, tattoos on my face, it started out as, you know, I want to be cool, I want to be a gangster, I want to scare people, you know. But it's come to the point to where it's, it's a statement. You don't look at a man or a woman that you see walking down the road and see tattoos on their face and their necks and their arms and judge them. I give my shirt off my back to anyone, I don't care who. I don't care what position you are in life. I will help you no matter what. I'm a nice person. I'm loud. I am very loud. And you can ask anybody. I am outspoken. And I will say very stupid, obnoxious things. But that's just, you know, that's who I've become. And, I, and I'm, I'm grateful for it. I'm proud of the man that I've become today. Since graduating God's Way Home. Ah, let's go back a little bit. Another, it was, <laughs> speaking of the little river, they baptized people in. It was raining. We was having church. It was pretty good rain. It was, it was, it was a storm. And I, I got up and started telling my testimony, you know, things that God's done for me. God's done so much for me. I don't know how I have socks left in my drawers because he's blessed every one of them I have off my feet. You know, like, I've had very, very good jobs since I started with God's Way Home. You know, 31 years old, didn't have a license. Four months after I got to God's Way Home, I had my driver's license, my own vehicle, a job, insurance on my car. And that's something that I like. Before... I could keep, I'd, I'd buy a car, keep it for a month, police take it. Buy another one, they take it. It comes to the point where they knew my face. If they seen my face behind the wheel of the car, it didn't matter if it was legal or not. If, it was in, if, if I was behind the wheel, it was gone. And if they seen me walking down the road in the middle of the night, because that's whenever I was out. I was not out in the daytime. Nothing good for me happened in the daytime. If they seen me out, they stopped me and searched me. They take what I have, they put me in jail, do a month, get out, do it again. Again and again, it was a vicious cycle, you know. But that day I was sitting in church and it was raining. And that still small voice told me again, he's like, it's time for you to be baptized. I was like, it's It's raining. I know where they baptize you at here, and it's not in the church. You know, it's pouring the rain. But then, you know, it comes to thought, and, uh, well, I'm going to get wet anyways. It's like, all right. So I said, when y'all going to do the next baptism? And it was, 
can, I think it was late in the fall and the, it was cold. <laughs> so I stood up and, I, and he said, we'll do it right now. So we cut church service short, went down to this river and it's, or creek, and it's usually pretty low and it was up. You know, we get down in there and we're almost floating away. Uh, I think four of us was baptized that day. And we get out of the water, go to the van to leave, and the keys was locked in the van. And it was cold. So we finally got in the van and stuff. But now, fast forward to my graduation, you know, I figured there'd be a few people there to help me celebrate my brothers and sisters in recovery and a few family family friends of the people that run the God's Way home. There was a lot of people there. <laughs> like, I didn't know I had that many people backing me. You know what I'm saying? Like, and it's God. It's God showing me. He's like, you, you've earned the respect of everyone in this room. People would not give me a drink of water. They would pee on me if I was on fire. But now I've got everyone sitting in this room that's got my back that will help me through the next part of my journey. Because being in recovery, in a recovery home, is easy. You have accountability. There are drug screens that you know that if you fail, you're going to be reprimanded. You're going to be punished. Words, whether whether it's you know being put on restriction again, a refocus, whatever it is, so that's gone. You know, I get my own place, and I get a change of job, and my world's kind of flipped a little bit. You know what I mean? Like I'm so used to the structure. And now, if I want to go down to the store and buy me a beer, I can do it and can't nobody say nothing to me. And I think about that, and I ponder on it for a while, and it sets in, and, and, and like the reality of I'm a free man now. I was on parole for the first six months I was at the program. So it was from being in the system on parole to being in the sober living home, always being watched. You know, people were always there. And then I'm not. And I slipped. I smoked pot. And he told me, he said, this is not what I had planned for you. And I was like, okay. You know, I know it's not. You're right. You're wrong. So I stopped. That's twice. I was able to put something down and not have to worry about it. It's gone. Put it at God's feet. The lady at the cross. I don't have the struggles no more. Used to wake up every morning wondering where I'm going to get my next fix. Now I wake up in the morning. And I, I work for a very godly man. I do roadside diesel mechanics. And it's another deal that he had with me. I used to not read my Bible at all. Like It was I, it was a fear reading and writing. Because I'm not uneducated, but I did not graduate high school. And my writing is crap. But... I pulled into work one morning. He said, I think, because I always keep my Bible in my truck. It stays in my truck. He said, it's time for you to open it up. You're not going to learn if you don't. So I started reading. Ever since, and this has been going on for a couple of weeks now. And every, you know, it seems like everything that I've been through or am going through at the present time, the Bible hits on it. You know what I mean? And at first it's like, oh, well, this is a coincidence, you know? I'm reading about this here, and this has happened in my life today. 
But whenever it goes from me reading about it to it going, ha- going on in my life, and then next thing you know, I'm in church. And they touch down on it too. I'm like, this ain't no coincidence. This is God thing. <laughs> and I'm telling you, if you're struggling in life, whether you're in addiction or not, everyone, addiction is everywhere, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, cigarettes, caffeine, whether it's porn, it does not matter. Addiction's addiction. You know, anything that you, you want to know what it's like to be an addict? Anyone in here that has a cell phone that lives for their cell phone that plays on it all day long, scrolling, I still do. Put it down for two days. Every time you think about the cell phone, every time you want to pick it up, think about that. That's what they go through. Every time that they want to use, you know, you pick up that cell phone, scroll through that cell phone a little bit. That's addiction. You know, you know, TikTok, Facebook. But, you know, it, like that's my biggest struggle now, that and cigarettes, is, you know, uh, entertainment. And, but God's blessed me. You know, he's, he's put me where I need to be in life. I'm still working on myself. I know that. Like, I fall short. Everyone does every day. It was one perfect, and that's no one sitting in this room, no one walking on the face of this earth. It was one man perfect. And he died so all of us could have a chance. The way. That way that we wouldn't fall under the old laws of the Bible. Where we could ask for forgiveness. Be forgiven. And finally make it to the home that we deserve. I just want to give thanks to God first. And to God's way home. For giving me a foot to stand on in life. Because I had none. I'd fallen short and I was headed to hell. And without God's way home, I'm pretty sure I'd be sitting there today. That's all I got. Thank you, Russell. That's just one of the many, many miracles. I mean, that's, you just heard his testimony. I mean, that's that's God written all over. You can't. There's no other way to explain it. You can't. You can't make it up. Um, I remember when he first came into the program, and we were sitting in a meeting, and he was. We were talking, and I opened it up to open share, and uh, he started crying, and he was talking about his salvation. You know, him turning his life over to Christ and coming to the altar. Um, and then I was blessed with the opportunity to get to disciple him in his early recovery and take him through the 12 steps and help him in his journey and just to watch him grow and where he's at today. And it's all, that's all glory to God, you know, and it's just, a, it's an absolute miracle. And I know that creek that he's talking about, because back in February, Andrew called me up and said, I got eight people that need, that want to get baptized. One of them, you're discipling. He said, he wants you to baptize them. I said, Andrew, it's February. That water is cold. Like, get a cattle trough, put it in Valley Works. We're going we're gonna to baptize people in warm water. They were like, well, they want moving water. I was like, well, they move the water a little bit, and we'll baptize. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, no, they want to be in the creek. And I'm telling you what, middle of February, it is cold. Cold. And eight people, you're in the water a long time. <laughs> and, and me and Andrew, we walked out. We didn't think we had legs anymore. I mean, from waist down, I mean, it was just completely numb. But it was an absolute blessing to, you know, get to have that up. I'll do it again. I don't care. It'd be snowing out. I don't care. I'll do it. Um, but God, and I, I'll just finish up with this. But God, God is a miracle worker, and he's working today. And I love what he said is that Andrew didn't look at him and judge him. He looked at him as Christ does. 
as one of his child that needed to be saved, that needed internal life of him and needed to be washed clean. And that's what Jesus does. Jesus went to the cross and died for us. We didn't deserve it one single bit, but he went to the cross and died for us because he loved us that much. And he still loves us that much. And, and, and that's what I love about Andrew and God's way home is when these folks come in there, we, we, we look at them as Christ does. And, and as we should do the same with people out there. Because when I was out in the madness, I was rejected. I was put down. I was looked at differently and so forth and so on. But then when I started meeting godly men and women, they started treating me like Christ does. And then when I started getting sober, they started teaching me the same thing. They said, no matter who you walk by in the street, no matter who you encounter, and no matter where they're at in life, sit down with them and share the gospel, pray with them, feed them, give them water, whatever you need to do, and love on them as Christ does. That's the same exact thing that we need to do. The same exact thing that we need to do. And, um, and it's just, again, it's just a blessing and uh, the opportunity to get to serve at God's way home and watch these men here in the back row and some of them at another church to watch them grow and flourish and, and do the right things. Um, and I'll give you some, some final words here, just quick little announcements. Uh, we'd love to have y'all. Again, we're down in right now, West Virginia, right at this corner of the stoplight. Uh, the staff is in there 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. Or really, honestly, you can really just stop by there any time. The guys would be more than welcome to open the door and make you a cup of coffee. And uh, we got one guy in there, Melvin. He's the house cook. He might even cook you some food, some bacon and eggs. Who knows? But uh, we'd love to have you down. Come on down and check us out. Um, come on down and volunteer in any way possible that you can. Um, Another thing is um, this ministry started off on prayer. And I just ask you all to continue to pray for God's way home, pray for these men, and pray, and not just for these men, but for the people out in the community that are still struggling and that need to hear the Lord um, and that need help. You know, continue to pray for them. And then the uh, other thing is we are a nonprofit organization. We're self-supporting. Uh, and uh, any type of financial help would be much appreciated. Uh, we do have options on being monthly supporters in any means in that way. So if the Lord lays it on your heart to do so, it uh, would be much appreciated so we can continue to grow and continue to reach people that are in need. Uh, we'll be up at the front with some brochures that have some information to give you. Um, you can go on our website, godswayhome.org. Uh, we're getting that updated, so a lot's going to be on there here in the near future. And then also uh, Facebook, uh, God's Way Home. You can follow us on Facebook. We do a lot of updates on them. So, again, I want to thank you all for having us. Thank you again for having us. And uh, God bless.